Hey, I thought I would do a series of videos on one of my favorite pieces of technology, the Game Boy. And even better, I teamed up with Live Overflow to look into some of the more interesting aspects of the Game Boy and some of its most famous games. The Game Boy is probably one of the most influential handhelds in history. But did you know that the infamous scrolling Nintendo logo is actually the copy protection of the Game Boy? Nintendo was very interested in only allowing approved games on the console, and if you look at the other Nintendo consoles of the time, such as the NES and the SNES, you will find that they solved it using a custom chip called the CIC, the Checking Integrated Circuit. Modern Vintage Gamer has a great video on it where he explains it in a lot of detail. On the Game Boy, however, Nintendo took a completely different path that relies less on technology and more on the law. When the console boots, the Nintendo logo is loaded from the cartridge. This is also why when you start the console without a cartridge, you just get a black block, and why sometimes you will only get a garbled Nintendo logo when the cartridge is not making great contact with the socket. Now, how does this provide copy protection? Let's look at the boot-up procedure of the Game Boy to find out. When the Game Boy boots, it executes a small piece of code that is burdened into the CPU. This is called the bootstrap ROM. The bootstrap ROM first copies the Nintendo logo from the cartridge into the video RAM and then scrolls it down the screen, until you hear the blink sound. Then it compares the logo stored on the cartridge with a fixed copy of the Nintendo logo in the CPU. If this comparison succeeds, the Game Boy will continue booting. If you would replace the logo on the cartridge, for example with the hacked logo you saw in the intro, the Game Boy will display the logo, bling, and then lock up, because the comparison between the Nintendo logo and the custom logo failed. To test this in the wild, I flashed a USB flash card with a Tetris ROM, and as you can see, the console boots up fine, blinks, and then goes into the game. However, with the modified logo, we can see the logo, hear the bling, and then nothing. The idea behind this was that if an unapproved publisher released a game cartridge, it would have to display the Nintendo logo to successfully boot, which would be a trademark violation and would allow Nintendo to sue to stop the sale of the game. Now, the way this check is implemented on the Game Boy means that the logo is read from the cartridge twice. The first time when the logo is displayed and scrolled, and the second time when it is checked against the local copy. So we basically have a time of use of the logo and a time of check of the logo. Now, imagine if we had a cartridge that would return the custom logo on the time of use and a different logo at the time of check. We would be able to boot our own Game Boy game without any trademark violation. This kind of bug is called a time of check to time of use, or talk to bug, and is a very common issue in bootloaders and boot ROMs and just software in general. Now, to exploit this, we would have to build our own cartridge, for example with a processor that stores the original and our custom logo. On the first read, it would return our custom logo, and on the second read, it would return the original Nintendo logo. But just how difficult is it to build your own cartridge? Let's check out how a cartridge works. The simplest type of cartridge is a ROM cartridge, a read-only memory cartridge with up to 32 kilobytes of storage. There are a lot of other types of cartridges, for example with memory bank controllers, battery-backed RAM, and even real-time clocks, but we will ignore all of these for now. If you look at the connector of a cartridge, you will see that it has 32 contacts. The outer two contacts are the power supply, 5 volts and ground. The second pin is a clock pin that gives a 1 MHz clock to the card, it's not used in a ROM card, so we will just ignore it for now. The next pin is the write pin, but as we are building a read-only memory cartridge, we don't care about this one either. The next pin is the read pin. When this pin is pulled to ground, the cartridge is supposed to perform a memory read and return the requested data. The fifth pin is a chip select pin. This is only used on cartridges with additional RAM, so again we simply ignore it for now. On the far right we have an audio pin. This pin allows a cartridge to play audio through the Game Boy speaker. For example, one could build an MP3 player card and have it play audio through the Game Boy speaker. This is almost never used in the wild. The next pin to the left of it is the reset pin, allowing the cartridge to reset the Game Boy. And now we are getting to the more interesting pins. These are the 16 address pins, allowing us to select an address in the cartridge to read or write to, and next to it are the 8 data pins, allowing us to read or write one byte at a time. Now let's say we want to read the address 0x104. We simply have to convert the address into binary and apply the address in the form of 5 volts for 1 and ground for 0 to the address pins. Then if we pull the read pin to ground, the cartridge will return the byte at that address on the 8 data pins. 
As you can see, the Game Boy cartridge bus is quite simple. You can build a simple ROM cartridge with basically a single parallel ROM chip. Given this, I was pretty confident I could easily implement my own cartridge on an FPGA, a field programmable gate array, basically a chip in which you can implement your own logic. In my case, I used a Digilent RT7, mainly because I had a few of these laying around and because it provides a lot of easily accessible I.O. Now, to connect the FPGA to the Game Boy, I needed to build a breakout board that gives me access to all the pins on the cartridge bus. As I was not patient enough to design and wait for a PCB to arrive, I decided to sacrifice one of my cartridges, cut through all the traces of the connector with an X-Acto knife, and soldered on 32 jumper wires which left me with this nice Franken cartridge. Perfect. Now the Game Boy runs at 5V logic levels, while my FPGA runs at 3.3V logic levels. This means we need to somehow convert these logic levels, so for example the address pins coming from the Game Boy to the FPGA from 5V to 3.3V, and the data pins coming from the FPGA to the Game Boy from 3.3 to 5V. Luckily I found a couple of TXS0108E breakouts in my component box. These are bidirectional level shifters and are built to handle exactly this kind of job. Unfortunately, they also turn out to be a bit problematic, as the automatic sensing mechanism, which senses in which direction they should level shift, didn't really work well together with the Game Boy. Luckily, this was solvable by directly driving the output enable pins on the level shifters. Then, using over 60 jumper wires and a breadboard, I ended up with this nice setup. The FPGA, the level shifters and finally the Game Boy. Time to write some code. My first goal was to build a cartridge that simply acts as a ROM cartridge and boots Tetris. This turned out to be relatively simple. In the constraint file of the FPGA, I mapped all the address and data pins into single registers so that my top module simply takes the address directly as a 16-bit input, the data pins as an 8-bit bidirectional in-out, and the other signals that we need from the cartridge as inputs. The game ROM is then directly loaded into a large 8-bit register array. Note that this only works in some FPGA synthesis tools and is kind of a lazy way to do this. In the always block here, which runs from the 100 MHz clock of the FPGA, you can see that there is just a check whether a read operation is occurring and if so, whatever is in the ROM array at the input address will be output on the data pins. After some more debugging of some faulty connections, it was finally time to test. Awesome, Tetris is booting from my own cartridge. Perfect. Now it was time to extend this to display the custom logo. But to do that, we first need to understand how the logo actually works. The boot up logo is 96 by 16 pixels black and white. And if we check the GBDEV wiki, we can see that it's at address 0x104 of the ROM and 48 bytes long. This wiki also helpfully gives us the data of the original logo, making it easy to reverse engineer the format. If we convert the first byte to binary and stare at it for a bit, we can see that each byte is a 2x4 pixel bitmap and that each 2 byte pair represents 4x4 pixels, making it quite easy to make our own logo, in my case simply the word hacked. Now it was time to figure out how to get the FPGA to display the custom logo while still successfully booting the game. When the read signal goes low, the FPGA needs to check whether the requested address is in the memory range of the logo. If yes, it checks whether this is the first time the logo is read. If so, it will return the requested byte from our custom logo. If it's not the first time the logo is read, we return the requested byte from the original logo. If the requested address does not fall into the memory range of the logo, we simply return the actual data from our ROM. A couple of lines of Verilog later, this was ready to test, so let's try it out. We can see our custom logo and it boots into Tetris. Awesome! We just bypassed the Game Boy copy protection. Now to make this a bit more reproducible, Life Overflow and me designed our own Game Boy cartridge. This cartridge can both be used as a ROM cartridge by putting a ROM chip on it and also acts as a breakout board. We will release it as soon as all aspects of it have been successfully tested. I hope you liked this video and to see you again on this channel soon. Thank you!